everybody to, oh, now that the, let me start that over. So now, since now we have recording in progress, um, note everybody that we are recording this session. Uh, I'm Sam Staley. I'm a member of the board of directors of the Florida Authors and Publishers Association, and welcome to Practical Tips for Authors. Um, uh, today, tonight we have Gina Hogan Edwards with us, who is a fantastic editor. I'm actually very quite proud to say that she's actually a friend of mine as well, and uh, she's helped me a lot over the years. In fact, I probably gave her one of the most challenging editing projects she had at some point, but that's probably another story. Uh, but we'll go ahead and get started. I'll uh, let Gina talk a little bit, and then, we'll, of course, we have Q&A. Uh, Gina, I'm sorry, I should have asked this before we even started, but do you prefer for um, questions to be wait, to wait until the end, or do you want them interspersed, or do you care? So, um, let's do them at the end. Okay. All right, so we'll let Gina go, and then we can have Q&A at the end. Uh, in the meantime, though, um, feel free to go ahead and put questions in the chat. I just don't expect them to be answered until uh, Gina finishes um, her presentation, and then we'll go from there. So anyway, I will uh, moderate that discussion, although, um, Gina, you're welcome to uh, work on your own, and I can just sort of intervene if necessary. But let me give you a little background about Gina. Um, she has been a professional editor, both in and out of the corporate world, uh, for more than 25 years. She is also a writer and the creator of, the, of a private Facebook group called Women Writing for Change. Uh, she is a certified creative creativity coach, a writing retreat leader, and a licensed Women Speak Circle leader as well. And like most creatives, she is obviously has her fingers in lots of endeavors, but the thing connecting them all is her desire to support the voices of those who have not been heard and to share stories that make the world a better place. Um, I am really excited to have Gina here tonight because if there's one piece of advice that I give to new authors is that you should engage an editor. And there are specific reasons why, and not only because I know that my writing needs a lot of editing, but also because there are all sorts of things we have to think about as a writer as we're preparing our manuscript um, to be uh, to go out into the real world. So with that, I'm just going to let Gina take over and then I'm going to recede into the background. So go ahead, Gina, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate that. And thank you all for inviting me tonight. I'm going to see if I can share my screen. And let's see if I can do this on the first attempt. All right. Are you all seeing, yeah. seeing yes. my screen? Okay, great. All right. So um, tonight, we're going to talk about some practical tips for looking for and for hiring the right editor. And <clears throat> just to give you a snapshot of what we're going to cover, um, we're going to talk about why hire an editor in the first place, especially if you're planning on traditionally publishing, why would you need to hire an editor? Um, we're going to talk about the different types of editing, because yes, there's more than one type and different editors sometimes use different language around uh, the terms. So we're going to talk about that. And then where can you find an editor and when should you look for one? And we'll go over some critical questions that you need to ask in order to make sure that you're getting a good match, and getting the right editor for yourself. And then we will, are going to talk about um, how much the investment will be for you to get an editor. So why hire an editor in the first place? The most obvious answer to that is to make your manuscript the best that it can be. Um, whether you're writing uh, as a career, whether you have uh, writing and publishing as a hobby, you might have a passion project that you want to put out into the world. Um, it, no matter what the situation is for you, you're going to want to put your best work out into the world. Um, you might ask if you're going traditional, uh, won't my agent or my publisher do that? Um, more and more agents are becoming editors, um, but the less work that they have to do when they represent an author, um, the greater chance of them representing you. Um, and more and more publishers are wanting polished work. Uh, they're wanting to, um, again, to have the best work come in the door. Uh, they're offering fewer and fewer services to authors to begin with. 
And so the best that you can polish that work before you give it to them, the better. Um, you usually only have one chance to show yourself off, to show your work off, whether that's to an agent or to a publisher or directly to your reader. So you do want your work to be the best that it can be before you put your manuscript in their hands. Um, a good editor, and this is what I think is the best reason for hiring an editor, a good editor is going to make you a better writer in the long term. Um, there's one thing that I'd like to acknowledge before we really get into, um, into this a little bit further, though. There is a conundrum in that it is usually the newer and the lesser experienced writers who need an editor the most. And yet, um, when you're first starting out, that's when you don't know whether you can justify that expense. Um, you don't know yet if your work is going to sell, if it's a passion project. Sales may not be that important to you, but you still have to weigh the priority of your project against the investment of time and the idea of putting your best work out there. All right, so for the types of editing, and I want to go over each one of these, um, these four different levels. What I would say is that um, sometimes editors and publishers and agents will use these terms in slightly different ways. And so what I'm going to talk about tonight are the way that I define these terms. I'm going to give you some benchmarks for how to have a conversation with an editor to give you the ability to, um, you know, ask them the right questions if maybe you're not talking in the same terms. So as you, as you interview somebody, just be sure that you understand what their definitions of these terms are. Um, so the four that we're going to go over tonight are developmental content line and copy editing. Um, whether you are revising on your own or you end up hiring a professional editor, these levels of editing should be done in this order. Um, it's unlikely that any of us would ever have the budget to hire some, a professional to work with you at every single one of these levels. Um, and so that's another reason to understand what each type is so that you can seek out the best support for yourself. So first of all, developmental editing. That is stage one before any other type of editing. Um, the author in this case works with the editor while the manuscript is being written. Uh, usually um, a writer will give the editor chapter by chapter or maybe scene by scene, and you'll work together toward completing a draft. Um, and the editor in most cases would only go through that manuscript with you one time. Um, developmental editing is always done at the idea stage. Um, if you're working on a nonfiction project, you will be working out your concept with them. If you're a fiction writer, you will be um, focusing on story and plot and characters and these other aspects of storytelling as you're developing your manuscript with that editor. Um, developmental editing is where a lot of decision making takes place. You'll work on structure and organization, and there's a real focus on consistency and clarity. Um, not every writer needs a developmental editor. Um, actually, in my experience, I have found that it's typically nonfiction projects where um, most people will hire a developmental editor. Okay, the next one in the, in the process or the flow is content editing. Um, where developmental editing focused on the decision making about these aspects, the structure and the organization and consistency and clarity, when you work with a content editor, they're going to be looking at a completed draft. So they're going to take a look at how well you've executed on these aspects. And that goes for fiction or nonfiction. Also, like, um, like developmental editing, um, a content editor is going to look at these different aspects of storytelling in a fiction work but rather than supporting the author during the development of these, the editor is looking at and then providing you feedback on how you've done um, in developing them on your own. Uh, content editing is also an evaluation of how true the author has stayed to what their original um, vision and intent for the story was. So that's something that's important for you to communicate to the editor when you first started, start working with them. 
so that you can make sure you're on the same page and that you actually follow through with that. Also, uh, editor wants a completed manuscript as far as the, the process is concerned, uh, hopefully one that you've revised multiple times. The editor might also work through it several times, but that's something that you'll need to agree to in advance, understand whether they're going to do one pass or more than one pass. This phase of editing must come before the line and copy editing. Um, every time a manuscript is touched is an opportunity for errors to get introduced. And so you want to make sure that your story is sound before you go to that line and copy editing stage. Content editing is sometimes called structural or substantive editing. And this is one point of confusion because some people also call developmental editing substantive editing. So again, just make sure that when you have the conversation with the potential editor that you're thinking about hiring, that you are defining these things in the same way. So after content editing is line and copy editing, and I'm going to talk about these two together because there are a lot of overlaps, but there are a few very distinct differences. Line editing looks at the manuscript on a paragraph level. When you work with a copy editor, they're going to be looking at the manuscript um, at a line and a word level. And again, this is how the terminology gets very confusing for folks, because you would think that line editing would be a line level look, but it's more of a paragraph and you know, scene level look where copy editing is, is line and word level. <clears throat> line editing looks at the transitions between scenes and paragraphs. It'll take into consideration whether you have any shifts in the tone or the point of view. Uh, copy editing focuses on things like continuity and consistency in spelling and capitalization, the use of numerals, uh, character names, character places, those types of things. So line editing focuses on language and story and flow and meaning, where copy editing focuses on the technical aspects of the writing. Now, here are some things that line and copy editing overlap. And what I want you to take away from this is that even though uh, the term might be the same, and I'm going to give you some examples to kind of clarify this, the tasks are very similar, but they're simply done at a different level. So let me use um, repetition as an example. A line editor might tell you, you already told me that that character has tendencies to be shy. You told me that in the last paragraph or in the last chapter. And when you told me that you used almost the same wording that you're using in this chapter. And so you might want to go back and do some revisions. If you're working with a copy editor, they might point out something like um, the fact that you've used the word again five times in 10 lines. So you can see that both have to do with repetition, but they're just looking at it at a different level. Copy editing is kind of a more micro line and word level. Um, to give you another example, um, let's say structure. Uh, a line editor would point out if uh, a paragraph or maybe a short scene unfolds in a disorganized way and that uh, if you leave it the way it is, it's going to confuse the reader because it confused, uh, uh, it confused her. A copy editor uh, looking at structure might offer you alternative wording for a confusing sentence uh, to make it more clear or to have better impact. So again, both of them are dealing with structure, but just at a different level. So these boundaries sometimes are a little bit um, hard to distinguish. Um, and also know that if you're working with an editor who offer lines at line editing, that same editor might also do copy editing, but they can't really be done in the same pass um, because they are looking at things at a different level. Um, it would take two different passes, once to do line and then once to do copy editing. Um, be aware too that if you use somebody for copy editing once and then you use a different person for the same type of service, copy editing, you might get different levels of service. You might get a, a, a different degree of how they look at things. So again, when you um, talk with them, just be sure that you understand what you're getting. 
Um, if a line editor or a copy editor during their work with you recognizes that the revisions that you're going to have to make um, are beyond the scope of their expertise to advise you on, then a good copy or line editor is going to make a recommendation to you um, to work with a copy editor or to work with a content editor. I'm, I'm sorry. So let me repeat that. If you're working with a line and copy editor and it turns out that the revisions or the issues that they are finding in your manuscript are beyond the scope of their abilities, then a really good one is going to refer you to a content editor and not try to keep slugging through the manuscript. So you might have noticed that in the original list of types of editing that I did not list proofreading. Um, proofreading is not editing. It's often confused with copy editing, but proofreading is strictly a check for typos. Uh, spelling, mistakes in punctuation, it is definitely a critical step in the process, but it isn't editing. So proofreading can occur at two stages, um, at one or the other, or sometimes at both. Um, the first uh, stage that it can occur at is before the layout. So the proofreader would just be looking at the text only. They would be checking for spelling and typos and punctuation. The other place that proof uh, proofreading can take place is pre-publication uh, pre proof. So your proofreader might look at an advanced reader's copy or a galley proof, and they're gonna compare those. So it's already laid out, headers, footers, page numbers, all that. They would compare that to the manuscript in its uh, text only stage and make sure that uh, during the layout process that no uh, errors were introduced. They might look at uh, things like any awkward uh, end of line breaks. If ellipses break in weird places, they may check to see that the page numbering is consistent, that your headers and your footers are consistent, and also look for any typographical errors. Another thing to note is that with today's technology, a proofreader might also check an ebook layout by looking at it on a device or maybe on multiple devices because the manuscript is not going to look the same on a Kindle as it would look on somebody's phone or um, somebody reading it on a desktop. But they might look to see if the uh, conversion, the e conversion, the ebook conversion created any problems. So, when should you start looking for an editor and when should you hire one? please don't wait until you need one. If you think that you're ready, um, if you think that you're ready to hand your manuscript off, you've probably waited too long. A more experienced editor, a qualified editor is usually going to have a wait list or a longer lead time. Um, so once you feel like you've got your manuscript almost ready, Go ahead and start looking because you're going to want to have time to make sure that you've got a good match. Um, allow yourself enough time to shop around. Uh, find an editor, again, that's a good match for your needs and your personality. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Don't schedule any book launches, any signings until you know what that editor's schedule is. And know that even then, sometimes it changes. If you're uh, working with a content editor, say, and um, or even a line editor, and they find an issue that neither one of you anticipated would be uh, would necessitate as many revisions as is going to take, then that could end up taking a, a longer amount of time for your editing. And so you don't want to have those book launch parties scheduled and then have to reschedule them. One last word about preparing to hire somebody, make sure that you budget in advance for the editing phase. It's part of the process. Um, and hopefully after today, you're gonna have an idea of what it will cost and what services that you are gonna need. So just be sure to build it into your publishing plan. Now, where can you find an editor? Professional organizations are one of the best places here in your organization. I'm sure you have editors who are members. Um, you can also look for editing specific organizations like the editors, 
Editorial Freelancers Association and ACES. And then any genre specific organizations that you might be a member of. Um, you know, if you write children's books, if you're in the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, again, there are gonna be editors who are members of these organizations. You can also find editors online and here are some alternatives for looking um, for them online. Several sites like Readsy and Freelance Writers Den and New York Book Writers have um, sites that match editors and writers. There are a lot of Facebook groups where editors and writers hang out together. One in particular that I want to note, and it's a weird name, EAE Ad Space, but it is specifically a Facebook group for matching writers and editors. And there's lots of others out there too. That's just one in particular that I know of. Um, also, some of the job related uh, platforms like Upwork. I'm not particularly a big fan fan of Fiverr, but you might get lucky and find some budding editor who's just out there trying to build a client base and so um, has a low rate, and so you might find somebody on Fiverr. What I consider to be the most reliable method, though, is personal referrals. Talk to your writer friends and find out who they've used. Um, just be sure that you, um, that you recognize that your, your needs might be a little bit different than theirs, depending on what genre you're writing in. So let's talk about some of the critical questions to ask. First of all, the obvious, what kind of services do they offer? Find out what type of editing that their expertise is focused on. Um, make sure that you're in an agreement about the definition of the terms that they use. And if they, if they use a term in a way that um, you don't understand or it's unclear, then stop them and ask them to clarify for you. Find out if they specialize or have uh, expertise in a, in a particular form, so like fiction, nonfiction, technical, business, that kind of thing, or in a specific genre. Um, look for an editor who knows the characteristics of your genre. So if you're a science fiction writer, an editor who understands world building. If you're a romance writer, you want an editor who knows what the expected tropes and the ones to avoid are. And then ask them what their process is like. What is the typical flow of the work between them and the editor um, or them and the author? Do they only do one pass for the fee that they're charging or are they going to do more? What kind of software do they use? Nowadays, it's pretty rare for an editor to do pen and ink markup, and they're usually going to charge more for that. So most editors are going to use Microsoft Word um, with the track changes and the comments features. So if you aren't familiar with those features, it would definitely save you time and money if you could learn those. There are a lot of YouTube videos online um, for learning the, those features. Also in terms of process, typically an editor of fiction is gonna use the Chicago Manual of Style. That may be different for a nonfiction editor depending on what kind of book it is. And so make sure that you know what kind of style book they're using. You don't necessarily have to be familiar with that style book or have to have a copy of it or use it yourself, but at least find out what kind of style book they're using uh, in case you do have some disagreements about things that you need to, to come to some consensus about. Ask them if they offer a sample edit. Some editors will do this and some don't. Some charge and some don't. Some of the ones that charge will apply what you've paid them for the sample uh, toward the total amount that will be due on the project if you end up working with them, if you end up becoming a client with them. So it isn't out of line to be charged for a sample edit. Don't be shy to ask them about their education and their qualifications and their experience level. Sometimes this is going to be on their website. Um, you know, do they have a related educational background? Do they have any specific editing certifications? Uh, how long have they been in business? Have they worked in the publishing industry? Have any of their authors won awards? Um, and a, another good question to ask is, are they also a writer? Of course, that's not required for them to be a good editor, but it's just a good thing for you to know. Ask them if they can put you in contact with any of their past clients, um, or do they have testimonials from real people that they can share with you? And then, oops, sorry about that. 
and then finally find out how much they charge. Some editors charge hourly, some charge by the word, um, some will quote you a flat rate for the entire project. Um, almost all of them are going to want to see the manuscript before they give you a quote. Um, also ask what do they expect regarding a payment schedule. We're going to talk a little bit more about this, but often a, a deposit is required just to secure your place on their editing uh, calendar. And total costs are going to depend on a variety of factors. And we're going to go over those here in just a minute. The editor, the editor that charges the most, just know, isn't always necessarily the best choice, but also the one who charges the least also isn't necessarily the best choice. So that takes us to our next topic, which is editing rates. These are rates that are taken from the Editorial Freelancers Association website. This is just a small snapshot of a very large table that's got a lot of information in it. Um, a lot of people will fixate on a number when they see a table like this and think that that is the gospel truth. That becomes an absolute for them. But I can't emphasize enough that um, costs really vary widely. Um, if, you, if you do want to see more, I'll tell you that this table on the EFA site includes things like rates for sensitivity readers, um, research and fact checking, uh, business and technical editing. Um, so again, the main thing that I want you to understand by looking at this, I just want to give you some benchmarks and just know that editing rates can vary considerably based on a lot of factors. So what are some of those factors? Naturally, length is uh, a consideration. Novels are generally going to cost more than a short story or a novella. Uh, but as we'll talk about in just a minute, a quality written novel could cost the same or maybe even less than a novella that needs a lot of attention. Some editors are going to work on a sliding scale. And so you may actually pay less per word for a particular service for a longer manuscript and for a short story. So another factor that comes into play naturally is the quality of the writing. The cleaner the manuscript is when you hand it off to the editor, the less your editing is gonna cost. If you're writing fiction, make sure that your plot and your character development are strong and to the best of your ability that the technical aspects of your manuscript um, are in order. Um, if you're aware that you're weak in a particular area, and you need to work on a specific uh, aspect of your writing, uh, focus on that before you hand it off, but then bring that to the attention of that editor and point out to him that that's one of your concerns. Of course, you'll wanna find out what type of editing. Um, copy editing to correct technical mistakes. Usually, not always, but usually costs less than content editing or line editing. Um, but these factors all play together. Uh, that rate also might depend on the editor's experience. So um, know how many passes that he or she will make through the manuscript and what kind of editing they're going to do when they, when they go through it. So let me give you a couple of examples based on just these first three factors. So let's say you have a 90,000 word novel and you've hired somebody to copy edit it and they're going to charge you two cents a word. That works out to $1,800. Let's say your buddy has written a 45,000 word novella and it needs a lot more work. And because of that, it's gonna need a line edit and that that's gonna be four cents a word. So that's also $1,800. So you can see how uh, a novel that's twice as long could still end up costing the same as a novella that needs a lot more work. And if you were to, if you were to submit a 45,000 word a business manuscript. Typically, business editing is a little bit more than fiction editing, and so that would cost um, that would cost even more than the eighteen hundred in the example here. All right, so let's look at some other factors. Factors that are unique to your story or genre. I mentioned sci-fi before, so um, you know if there's a lot of wor wor world build building and a lot of detail involved, then that's something the editor is going to have to pay attention to. Um, a business book that has a lot of tables or maybe has a lot of photos with captions, um, those are going to affect your, your price as well. 
the number of times that the editor goes through the book. Um, you will pay more for an editor to go through the manuscript more than once, but it usually doesn't cost twice as much. Just know that um, revisions always introduce new errors. So if you're working on a line edit with an editor and they give it back to you for revisions, even though you are focusing on what they've given you as feedback and you're hopefully doing the best that you can to make those revisions, there's always a chance, always a possibility that a new error has been introduced. And so being able to have somebody go through it again for you is definitely an advantage. The editor's location and experience are gonna play into it. Big city editors are gonna charge more than those of us who live in smaller towns or in rural areas. Experience is typically gonna cost you more. Uh, you might save money by hiring somebody just starting out, but there's also the potential that you might sacrifice some quality. And then finally, the deadline. Uh, a lot of editors will upcharge uh, for a rush job, sometimes as much as 25% or more. So be sure that you check the editor's schedule, uh, consider any commitments that you might have made already. You know, if you, if you have already scheduled your book signing against my advice, uh, then you'll have to take that into consideration. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what you can expect in terms of um, how an editor expects to get paid and what those options might be. Some editors are going to quote you based on the entire project. They're going to give you one flat rate, start, start to finish. Uh, that might be based on uh, a per word rate. It might be based on a per page rate. Uh, they will also consider these other factors that we just went over too. Uh, so it might not be as clear cut as it seems on the surface. Um, but there are, are editors too who work on an hourly rate. As far as payment options are concerned, you can expect usually to give a deposit to hold your space. Uh, some will expect a partial payment or, um, or the deposit before they start any work, and then the rest when the work gets done. Others might ask for full payment up front. That's not unusual at all. Um, some will offer a discount if you pay in full in advance, and again, some don't. So just know that you understand what that particular editor has to offer for you. If you're working with an editor that you've worked with before, then they might be willing to work out installment plans for you too. Make sure that you get everything that you've discussed with the potential editor in writing. From a detailed description of the work that they're gonna do, the type of editing, how much they're charging, when and how they um, want you to pay them, and uh, one important aspect to be sure is included is the cancellation policy. Um, life happens, unexpected things come up, and that could be on either end, on your end or theirs. So just know that you understand what the cancellation policy is for any kind of unexpected situation. So before you commit, Make sure that you do all the revisions that you can possibly do on your own. Make it the best manuscript that you can make it um, before you hand it off. And make sure that you do it in the right order too, in the order that we've talked about. Go through that manuscript and make sure your story is, is strong and robust and then start looking at the line level and then the copy uh, editing level and then finally proofread it. Make sure that when you're interviewing an editor that you talk to that person. And I'm not talking about email. Talk to them on the phone, have a Zoom session with them. If, you're, if it's possible, meet them in person. Uh, hopefully after today, you'll have some good questions to ask them, have those prepared in advance. Um, make sure that you're very clear with them about what you feel like your needs are. Sometimes we don't necessarily recognize our own strengths and weaknesses um, clearly, but communicate the best you can as far as what you feel like you need to work on and what you think you've really done well. Make sure that you understand how that editor works in terms of timing and then how much they're going to charge, how they work back and forth with the author in terms of of file sharing and which software they're using and those things that we talked about earlier. And then finally, make sure that there's some chemistry there, that it feels like a really good match to you. 
Make sure that you give yourself enough time to talk to more than one editor. Don't hire the first one that you interview, even if it seems like a really good match. Um, before you sign off on anything, if that editor does take sample edits, make sure that you've given them the manuscript and that you've gotten that sample edit back. A sample edit to me is one of the best ways to make sure that you and the editor are a good match. When you get those edits back, the comments should be clear, they should be helpful the, and respectful. The uh, suggestions that they offer should be, uh, should make apparent to you whether their help is gonna help you make your writing better. Are you gonna learn from what that editor has provided to you? Do you like what their communication style is? The editor's got to be honest with you uh, and you have to separate yourself emotionally from the work, but you can tell when an editor has the best interest at heart. By, by their comments and a sample edit is really good for doing that. So then you'll gather your quotes and you'll compare your quotes. And then finally, if you've got any last questions to ask them, you'll want to do that before you sign that, that agreement. So a few final words just to wrap up here. The thing that I really want you to remember is that your editor is on your team. The editor is your advocate and not your enemy. You're working toward the same goal. Uh, keep yourself open to learning and to growing. Take in whatever feedback and suggestions that they offer and give yourself time to process those, to absorb, absorb the information and see what you can learn from it. Whenever there's an issue that comes up in your writing more than once or more than twice, pay attention to that. You know that those then are gonna be the areas that you need to improve upon. And know that you're not going to always agree with your editor, and that's all right. If you come up with something that you're in a disagreement about, just talk through it and come to some kind of a, consen a consensus or a resolution. And finally, just be confident. Expect to receive respect from the editor and expect to give the respect. And remember that this is your story. Follow your gut. This is your project, and so your instincts are going to be a divining rod for you. Remember that you're initially drafting the manuscript for yourself. You write what you want to write from your heart. And then everything that you do in the revision stage and in the editing stage is for your reader. In the end, it's all for your reader. So thank you, I appreciate you having me. So hopefully we've got some time for some q and A. I I do see some things in the chat. We do. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't see anything in the, yeah. I don't see anything in the chat right now, but feel free to, for people to add to the chat. But you just, we can just take questions now live. If you, if anyone wants to unmute. unmute. Looks like Kristen has a question. Oh, Kristen. Yep. Uh, yes. Well, first of all, I love that the last line you said, because that is that is so true. You write your draft and it and you, like sometimes I save that first draft before I give it to the editor, because I know that's mine. That's my story. And then from then on, it's it's not. And that's really something that my two questions are. Um, so why is business editing? Why does that cost more? I'm not sure that I have an answer for that. I wondered that myself, but typically business editing is, is going to cost more. So if you're writing a, a nonfiction book, um, especially if it's to the business market, uh, typically the business editors charge more than okay. fiction editors do. And then my second question is about um, developmental or yeah, developmental editing for nonfiction. So mm -hmm. since I write fiction, I know why it's so important to me. So what does the developmental? Well, remember that the, develop, the developmental editor is working with the author during the writing, you know, oh. as they're creating the publication, as they're creating their manuscript. And so a lot of times, um, and I'll, I'll use like a self-help book for a, an example. A lot of times the writer will have so many things that they want to say 
and so many things that they want to share, but they don't necessarily know how to structure it or what organization you know, to use. And so a developmental editor will have a conversation with the writer about what their intent is, what they're trying to accomplish by doing this book, and then make suggestions as far as how to organize the information, what to leave in, what to take out. But they will do that with a, a developmental editor will do that as the writer is writing it. And so um, chapter by chapter, or if it's fiction, scene by scene sometimes. Um, so remember that the developmental editor is, is actually working with the writer while they are creating that manuscript. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, I see a question from Joan in the chat. Um, she says she wrote her first novel and wrote and wrote. And she's edited it, but it's still too long. What type of editing would I need? You've got the manuscript complete already. And so if you want an editor to help you cut it down, then someone who does content editing, maybe a line editor that's really experienced could help you with that. Does that help, Joan? Anybody else have a question? Yes, yes, that's that's very helpful. Um, good, good. Thank you very much. So as a follow up, Gina, to Joan's question, mm -hmm. how would you decide, is, is there a rule of thumb about when you might want to use a content editor versus a line editor based on how much you need to compress the manuscript? Or uh, so I generally have a rule of thumb that if I'm going to have to cut out say more than 20% of the mm -hmm. content that I really need to look at the entire manuscript on a, on a much bigger level than just if I'm trying to cut a few paragraphs here or there, even a chapter here or there. Do you have a, you have any thoughts on that? What I would say is uh, if it's, if it's fiction and you feel like your plot and your character development are really strong, then you might be able to go to a really experienced line editor to help you trim it down because you won't have so many story level issues. If, however, you think that maybe you've got gaps, maybe you've got some inconsistencies in your story, then you would probably want to approach a content editor. If it's a business manuscript, then I think your suggestion is probably good to, to do it by like a percentage of how much you think you need to cut down. If you've got if you've got a business manuscript that's twice as long as it needs to be, you're going to need a content editor. Then, you know, if you've got something that's maybe 10 to 15 or 20 percent over, you might want to go to a line editor. Let's see, Sue asks, what is your opinion on some of the computer editor programs like Grammarly? Um, some of them, in my experience, and Grammarly and ProWriting Aid are the two that I've, I've had the most exposure to. There are certain things that they do very well. And I think that for especially a new writer that they're a good step in the process, but you can't replace the, um, you can't replace the brain of a human being. I don't care how good the software is. I still recommend that you that you try to find a, a human being to work with. So I know that sounds self-serving, but. Did, was that question to you directly, Gina, or was that to the entire group? Oh, oh it looks like she might've sent it directly to me. Okay, so just a, just a suggestion for everyone. If you could make the question available to everyone to see, that would be very helpful. In part because I've got a very glitchy internet tonight, and so I'm never sure if one of those glitches got rid of it, so I may miss it. Um, so it sort of makes sure we actually have that. Um, okay, so do we have any more questions? Let's see, Joan asks, can I email you for a recommendation? So Joan, are you asking for like a referral to an editor? If, if yeah. that's the case, certainly. Yeah. Yes, I am. Absolutely. Feel free to do that. And okay. I think, let's see, let me put my email address in the chat. 
Oh, Nathan. great. It's a long one, but it's easy to remember. It's Gina at aroundtheridertstable.com. Okay, got it. Gina, do you have any thoughts about what are the things a writer should look for in terms of who might be better at copy editing versus content editing? Are there certain personality types? Are there certain, um, are there going to be some people that are better at one or the other? I've, and I'm asking because I've run into two situations where I found the editor was asked to do content editing, but they actually were a much better copy editor than they were actually a content editor. And so I'm just, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. <laughs> Let me see if I can do this diplomatically. Sometimes we don't know our own strengths and weaknesses. And I don't necessarily think that it's so much a personality issue as it is a case of that individual maybe not recognizing where their strengths lie and maybe aspiring to be something that they don't yet have the experience doing. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so I, mean, I've, yeah. I've, I've had similar questions before about like, you know, do introverts make good editors? And I hate to generalize like that. Yeah. What can, oh, so I'm going to press you a little bit more on mm -hmm. this. Can a good content, uh, content editor be a good copy editor? Yes, but they can't do it in the same pass. They can't possibly do it at the same time. So if you, and even if you hire an editor to do line editing um, and content editing, even though, even though there are some overlaps sometimes there, they have to be done in different passes to be done effectively. There's so much chance that when you work with a content editor that you're going to end up having revisions, uh, possibly to, um, to the storyline or maybe just a reorganization of some scenes or chapters. And so um, the line editing or the copy editing are going to have to be done at a different stage. Thank you, Nancy. Hope that was helpful. Any other questions? Can I, Gina? Um, yes. Will the slides be available? Um, your PowerPoint? Sure. I can I can make those into a PDF um, deck if um, Sam, should I send them to you or Pat? Um, either one, or you can send them to both Pat and me, and we'll okay. make sure it gets out to the okay. to everyone here. Great. Okay. It looks like Gwen's got a question too. If you participate in a critique group and they've provided feedback, what type of editor would you use after you've completed your manuscript? It's always helpful to have as many eyes on the manuscript as possible. Uh, there are so many different different ways that critique groups operate. I don't know that there's one answer to that question. Uh, I, would, I would probably at that point approach a line editor, but again, make sure that you understand what they consider line editing to be. And if they are a reputable editor and they're not capable of doing what your manuscript needs, they might refer you to a content editor. It also depends on how many, you know, how many revisions have you made through that, through that manuscript yourself, because I've worked with writers who brought their manuscript to me after they've gone through it twice. And I've worked with writers who have brought their manuscript to me literally after going through it 25 and 30 times on their own. So it really just depends on how many revisions you've done yourself. Thanks, Gina. Mm -hmm. It's a reality that, as I said at the very beginning of the presentation, 
that if you're a new writer, if you've not published before, that's usually when you need the most support. And it's so uh, challenging at that stage to make that judgment of um, whether you can make that investment or not. And it is an investment. It's an investment of time and money and heart. And it's a hard decision to make. So in general, I would say if you've got limited budget, just do as many revisions as you possibly can on your own. Make that manuscript as good as you can make it on your own. If you can get beta readers or a critique group and, and a critique group that really gives you substantive feedback, not just pats on the back or um, a group that doesn't hijack your story by saying, oh, you should do this and you should do that. But somebody who really gives you constructive feedback and get as many eyes on it as you possibly can. And then, um, you know, if you're writing fiction and you've, you've done that, you've done multiple revisions yourself and you've had other eyes on it, then maybe start out by talking to a line editor. And, you know, again, if you get a reputable one, they can refer you either way. You know, oh, this looks great. You could probably go to copy editing stage or this really needs more work in this, on the story level. Any more questions? Sam, I'm not sure if you're frozen. I saw his eyes move. Ah, good, good, okay. So a shortcut for remembering those, those layers of, of editing. Developmental is at the ideation and the creation stage. Content is more a focus on story and structure. Uh, the line editing is gonna be about the use of language, meaning, impact of the story. Copy editing is gonna be about the mechanics of your writing. So those kind of give you a little snapshot. There is overlap, as I, as I said in the presentation, but those will give you a little bit of a guideline. Okay. Kristen, one more have question. question? Yeah, I, we had talked about this before, but um, so if, you go through, you get an editor and you go through that process. And then if you would happen to get a literary agent then how do literary agents generally, are they going to edit it also? Um, that's a real good question. Publishers, let's start there. Uh, publishers as a generality are offering fewer services to writers than they used to. In the past, a publisher would put a manuscript through about four layers of editing, all of these, all these different levels that we've talked about. Um, some still do, but that's not always the case. So literary agents, a lot of them now, are also doing editing. So they'll not only be your agent, but they will work with you as an editor before they submit it to the publisher. Uh, not all of them do that, but many of them do because it's in their best interest to help you make that manuscript as good as possible before going to the publisher. Come back one more step though, and the better you can make that manuscript before you approach that literary agent, the more chance they're gonna to wanna to represent you because the less work they're gonna to have to do. So you need an editor no matter what. I mean, if, especially if you wanna. Having an editor is definitely an advantage. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. Let's see, for an historical with many photos, is copy editing okay? Um, historical in, in terms of like factual historical, I'm assuming you're asking as opposed to like historical fiction. Um, it depends on whether you want that editor to help you do any fact checking or not. That's gonna obviously add to the expense. Um, if you feel like your manuscript is, is, is sound in terms of the content and uh, you want them to check captions and things like that, then yes, copy editing might be a good place to start.
Good questions, everybody. Anybody else before we go? Yeah, I, I'll just make a, a quick comment. Um, the last two books, nonfiction books that, that I have published with a major publisher, what's been interesting as I've looked at over the last several decades is that the larger publishers are no longer doing content editing. They're, they're making sure the manuscripts are have the content before they even go into the process. And the copy editing is done typically in house, but it's locked so that as the author, I've only been able to say yes or no, or respond to a query. So I think what that's, and then there's a proofreading, which I, my last two manuscripts, I never saw the proofreading. It was just done completely in house. And I think what's happening is one, the content editing is a very expensive part of the process. They are really expecting authors to shoulder the burden of the editing for content. And they're trying to minimize the production, the, the costs associated with the production of the book itself. So, and these are larger publishers, hundreds of titles a year um, that they, they publish. So I think that is just emphasizing that for authors, the editing is even more important than in the past. And we just have to expect to pay a lot more attention to that up front. Oh, and there's a question. How does a copy editor advertise? Uh, sometimes they will put ads in the association related publications. Uh, Florida Writers Association is a good example. Uh, there'll be advertisers there. I know in the Tallahassee Writers Association, the electronic newsletter that goes out, copy editors will have ads there. Uh, a lot of copy editors don't even advertise. It's just word of mouth. And that's why I always think it's a good idea to, to ask your writing buddies who, who have they used. And the Facebook groups really are a good place to find find editors too. Again, you're going to want to go through the vetting process and ask them the questions that we've talked about tonight and make sure you're getting a good match and both personality wise and content wise, um, expertise wise. But um, Facebook groups are sometimes a good place to find them as well. Okay, we are at eight o'clock. So I think we will close the formal part of the meeting. I don't know if Gina, if you have a few minutes to hang out with a, a few people afterwards or not, but I think we can release everyone if they all, they need to all go head out to the bars and, and really begin <laughs> to loosen up for the right, late night writing, yeah. uh, get a glass of wine or whatever it might be. And yeah. then we'll stop recording at this point as well, I think. So anyway, thank, Gina, you, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, you having yeah. me. Thank you. So Maria is still here and Janice is still here. In Terry, no, I know that's not yeah. Terry. It could be Terry, but it's, yeah. So. Do you need me to stay on, Sam? No, um, Gina, if you're, you're um, thank you so much for this. I think this is really important. And um, I, I think you gave a lot of really great information. I was, I was sort of kicking my. Yep. I'm sorry. It's all for, well, I'm in the middle of this at, at the end of the semester, so it's a little bit, but I would love to do this again. Awesome. But Thank anyway. you. I, I appreciate yep. it. And I'll get uh, the PDFs to you guys of the slides so that you can share them as you want to. All right. Thank you, Gina. Great Thank to you. see you again. All right. Same here. Good night. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Pat. I hope you feel better soon. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye.